happened some years ago when my young son, Darren, was 12 years old um, and asked me, you know, are UFOs real, Dad? An absolutely uh, firm skeptic about such things, but, well, it took me something like uh, over 30 years, shall we say, in all, give him his answer. This entire question through my researches, I got, it got more and more serious. And I connected up the dots. I had before me a story that actually blew my head off. The, the answer I was giving to my son and my children and to be something that maybe this is something that every single human being on the earth ought to really take seriously. It was a, a completely new look at the entire existential scale as we understand it. And I have completely revised my view about this and I find that this whole business of UFOs and all of that is probably, as I said, one of the most serious, if not the most serious question that anyone can, can posture in the world today. The only thing that ties all of them together is two primal states of being, natural or artificial. Watch the artificial one. This is Off Planet Radio. Welcome back once again to Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. Curling into the apocalypse such as it is. Those of you who have listened for over, you know, the last decade, but certainly over the last couple of years know that the course that we've been on is the one that uh, has been the long arc of the show for, well, over a decade now. And uh, I'm thrilled today to be able to revisit uh, probably one of the most important shows that I ever did. Uh, there's a, a tinge of sadness to it, and at the same time, there's um, some jubilation in the work that's been accomplished. Today, we're going to discuss the subject of gray aliens, and this time, we're going to discuss it from the standpoint of artificial intelligence and the future of humanity. And um, the book is Great Aliens and Artificial Intelligence, The Battle Between Natural and Synthetic Beings for the Human Soul. It is written by Nigel Kerner. And with me today are two guests who will expand upon this. Sadly, we lost Nigel earlier this year. He passed away. But he did not pass away without completing what was fundamentally a 30-year work of his life. It began with a question that was asked by his 12-year-old son, Dad, are UFOs real? And unlike many parents who would take a child's question such as that and maybe the kind of answers I got when I was a kid, a slap across the head, don't be absurd. Well, excuse me, but what am I seeing in the sky right now? Uh, Nigel didn't do that. He spent 30 years of his life plus investigating, researching, compiling, and publishing with the help of his colleagues three books that summarize the threat to humanity both external and internal, as we veer towards this this particularly historical juncture in humanity's history. And I want to welcome to the microphone today my two guests. First is Danielle Silverman, who is, was and is Nigel's research associate. And she is responsible for pulling together a lot of the nuts and the bolts over the years, including the, the, the times that she was connecting um, us as we did uh, shows together, dating back to 2010, and then I, get, I believe again in 2011, uh, I did a show with Nigel. And those shows are available on the website at offplanetradio.com, as will be this as a fitting 
not just memorial, but a tribute to the work ongoing. We welcome Danielle Silverman, and with us also uh, a person who was present with us on that historical 2010 teleconference call. We have Professor John Biggerstaff as well, coming to us from across the pond. Good morning, good afternoon, welcome to both of you. Thank you, Randy. So happy to be here. Thanks, Randy. It's good to be back. It's good to hear both your voices. Um, <clears throat> as I kind of introed this, we, we are so happy to be able to sit down and discuss the book, the new book, Grey Aliens and Artificial Intelligence, and yet at the same time, obviously, one voice is missing from the conversation today. Actually, two are missing, because uh, Dr. Andrew Silverman is a part of this discussion as well. Uh, but missing most prominently is the booming voice of Nigel Kerner. Absolutely. I don't think um, uh, we can ever replace that uh, incredible person. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, he was quite unique and remarkable, and I think that's reflected in his work. This book um, was obviously very long in uh, coming together. Uh, it appears that look, almost... From the time of publication of the, the Grey Aliens and Harvesting of Souls, we're almost 11, 12 years out on this, but it looks as though this work was completed timely. Did, Nigel had an opportunity to complete this book before he passed, is that correct? He did indeed, and it was already accepted by the publisher um, several months um, before he passed away, um, and uh, just, yes, unfortunately, he didn't get to see the final publication itself, but the book was completed way before um, he died, yes. I suspect that uh, somehow he's quite aware of uh, the outcome of all of this. Uh, his belief in life beyond this veil was, was strong enough, and uh, his uh, life force continues to extend itself out there. So we're, we're dealing with, obviously, a huge subject. The, the, the book itself is um, well over 600 pages. Don't be frightened by that, by the way, because it is, while it is an intensive read, it is a read that's buffered by the humanity and wit that uh, Nigel employed throughout his, his career, both in, in all of his careers. Uh, he's a multi-talented, multi-faceted human being who um, used wit and um, great humor, color to bring forth ideas that are complex. So where do we begin with a book this voluminous? How do we address this subject? How do we bring it up to speed from where we were in 2010, 2011, when we were talking about the alien soul harvesting? Well, um, what I would say is uh, this particular book is especially timely because since that time, there have been so many incredible transformations in terms of our uh, headlong propulsion, rather like lemmings, towards um, a situation in which technology mortgages our humanity, um, and especially um, after the pandemic, which kind of made things grow quantumly because everything became online. We were forced to um, keep away from each other. Um, we weren't able to have human contact, uh, online communication, working from home, doing uh, uh, so social media as well grew exponentially so that we became accustomed even more to a virtual artificial existence that with less and less of that magical ingredient of humanity that you described and Nigel has so powerfully okay with less and less of that in our lives and this latest book really um gives a picture of what can happen if we continue to mortgage ourselves to that kind of future and we don't take care of the very, very precious ingredient that makes us different from these artificial visitors uh, that we call the grey aliens. In fact, they t there's this um, talk of what they call the Great Reset, 
um, which it sounds like some kind of conspiracy idea, but incredibly, it's not. It's it's absolutely mainstream and being promoted by the EU, the World Economic Forum, and they talk about trying to achieve a fusion of our physical, digital, and biological identities. And what better description could you have of a realization of what these artificially intelligent gray alien visitors might be trying to achieve than that? John, go ahead, please. Things have changed in in such a way that a few years ago we wouldn't have believed that, that these sort of things could have occurred. Although, you know, many of us knew this type of thing was coming. Nigel and I, for many, many years... Uh, have discussed these things and it, it's been obvious that there's there's a trend really to dumb down human beings so that they will be more compatible and more more materialistic and therefore compatible with the artificial intelligence program which is sort of unemotional it's it's not a living thing it's just pure responses and logic which is consistent with Nigel's uh, hypothesis that you know the the greys are actually attempting to merge with us in some way and of course in this book he asks the question why why would they merge with us is it to get hold of our DNA but they've already got the technology to make that DNA and his conclusion really is that there's a big difference between what is living and what is not living and he writes on page 17 of this book we are used to assuming that there is a fundamental difference between that which lives naturally and that which doesn't but recent advances in biotechnology blur that distinction in as much as artificial synthetic DNA that can replicate itself has been produced and cloning procedures have been refined. So what what's really happening here is that people are, are, are using their will to, to drive effectively um, their, their compliance with an artificial intelligence system. So that in the end, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, when it when it really goes from things like cell phones to wearable devices to implanted devices to to effectively neural chips, people won't really know who they are, and therefore their decision making processes are really uh, subtended away from them. And the concept that Nigel pushes uh, talks about so much the concept of of will. Um, that drives, you know, as well as awareness, that uh, unique properties of living things um, will eventually will be disappear. They'll disappear. Yeah, it is the most frightening of um, scenarios, and I think for those of us who are, let us just say, uh, uh, older, having. I mean, I, I grew up in the, in the 60s and 70s, so I grew up yeah. in a time when obviously technology was growing, but we were barely at the point where we had transistors, much less clusters of tens of millions of transistors on a silicon chip at five nanometers, yeah. which are capable of uh, incredible computational cycles. And that I'm, now we're talking about what's built into our phones and not even our desktop. Mm. Devices. And to serve all of this, you know, and all of this monitoring, they, you know, they're, they're putting chips or they're about to put chips into people with sensors in that will measure your health status, they'll measure your glucose, your stress levels, they'll measure absolute, absolutely everything about you. Um, and in order to serve that, they've increased the amount of electromagnetic radiation in the atmosphere mm -hmm. so considerably that effectively that is becoming dangerous in its own right. It's interesting because um, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, a time that's not lost on me that, that was parallel in some ways to the time we live in right now, we had the Spanish flu. And we had uh, warnings from Rudolf Steiner who told us about, you know, then this, this proliferating virus wave being connected to what was then just the, the beginning of the radio era. We didn't even have TV. We had telegraph and we had the, 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 the nascent radio waves beginning to blanket the earth. 
Yeah. And so it appears as though there's some sort of bedding that's required in order to do a very gradual insurgence into the human biological system with yes. frequencies. Absolutely. John, your background, what is your, your background specifically is in, is in biology? Is it in also in genetics? Can you give us a little bit of your own background? Well, my first degree is in uh, medical biochemistry. Okay. And my, then I've got a diploma in medical immunology uh, and a PhD in cell biology and biochemistry. Okay. Uh, in which I used uh, an understanding of inflammation. Uh, cancer uh, and and all of that biology to show how the immune system could be modulated by these inflammatory responses. So when COVID came along, it was perfectly obvious uh, to me that something wasn't really right in the way it was all being reported. Thank you. Um, you are eminently qualified to make that statement. That, of course, is what you know. I suspected, many of us suspected early on, was that um, you know, how would you say it? There's something rotten in Denmark when it came to uh, yeah. um, uh, what was presented as the story behind this this overnight panic over what was effectively a, a, a virus and. I mean, I'm not a denier of the virus itself. I had something that they called COVID myself. I'm not sure what it was or what constituted it. I know I was ill for a number of weeks with it. And I know that having gone back and looked now at the, um, the patents and the work that was done prior to even 2010, it's very obvious that this was out there. This was something that was, let's just say, waiting in the wings, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I'll stop short of calling it what I believe it really is, but I will say that um, the evidence that we were given, I actually, with my... Um, co-host at the time, Emily Moyer, interviewed Dr. David Martin, who was a professor at the University of Virginia, who has a background in both medicine and um, medical technology, who explained the framework of the patents behind the virus itself and the research that had been ongoing. Right. So we're not offering conspiracy theories here. We're simply stating that, you know, what we were told about the virus itself and what we were then later offered as solutions were part of what I consider to be, uh, let's just say, a, a trajectory towards where we are headed now, that there was a technological overlap in all of this. Yeah. yeah, I think these are all, you know, there are several arms all moving towards a common center, um, which is which has really got the subjugation of human race in mind. And I, I think for the purpose of the adaptation of an alien programmed agenda um, into the continuance that human beings are able to do, but machines are not. So... It leaves me with, I have so many questions, and um, some of this I have to cloak somewhat in code, otherwise we'll never be able to publish this, because uh, it is still a sensitive, sensitive subject matter in terms of generating controversy, and yet we can't be afraid of that. Um, I was heavily censored during lockdown um, to the point where my YouTube channel was uh, taken down. And, you know, that was temporary. We're back, but um, I'm circumspect. Let us go with some fundamental understandings about DNA and what's presented by Nigel because I I just keyword search DNA on the text um, electronically of the book and it's uh, voluminous how much Nigel references DNA and he does, specifically um, what he calls 
devolution of the natural momentum of living species in a physically entropic universe. In other words, uh, there's something, there's a mystery to DNA that was not understood. The non-coding DNA, what, what you know, pop culture refers mm-hmm. to as, as, as junk DNA. I don't personally believe it's junk DNA. And in fact, I have some understanding of what we're dealing with, and it's quite marvelous. But yes. the concept of non-coding DNA and the limitations supposedly expressed by science regarding DNA, and yet the seemingly advanced sudden leap in uh, engineered mRNA in vaccines seems to me to be kind of a, a quantum leap forward, uh, almost from a, it was, it's almost like from a being at a standstill to doing an astonishing 20 foot leap in the air. So mm. what are we looking at with DNA in terms of medical applications? Well, in terms of, of um these medical applications, the um, but the the concept of the DNA um, is that you know I mean the, the DNA really comes back and Nigel's Nigel's big thrust with the with the DNA was that it um, you know people are making synthetic DNA and how are you gonna can you tell the difference between what is alive and what is not alive. And he 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 really states that um, really a living thing has a connection back to to really its consciousness, which which is able to drive it and overcome the entropic uh, the entropic drift that all material things are susceptible to, and it's this consciousness or soul that the that is the thing that's most attractive to these greys and to the artificial intelligences for their continuance. This compl- whole complex of thoughts spinning through my head right now, and I'm trying... I hope they made sense. <laughs> no, no, it makes sense. It's, it's just... Um, there are so many angles you can take this, this from. So you know, the place I want to go with this is... Um, I don't have this information in front of me right now. I've been in in process of researching and writing a book over the last two and a half years. Um, I had no idea when I began this just how uh, arduous a task it is to write a book. Uh, in the course of doing research, and some of the research has been uh, aired as podcasts over the last two years, I recall reading... And back in the early 90s, Russian scientists had taken a um, strand of DNA and exposed it to a laser. And that when they shut the laser down, the DNA itself continued to fluoresce light. And this was Indeed. deemed at the time to be quite phenomenal. It was not a it was not an aspect of DNA that had been explored before. And in fact, I can't yes. find where there was a replication of this experiment outside of the Russian scientists. But the longer I pondered this and came to realize that that what we're talking about, and I will extend this now into the metaphor that was given to us by Dr. Andrew Silverman in his work with the Shroud of Turin, yeah. and the aspects of that having to do with light as part of a property of a of a divine being, of a being possessed of something beyond mere physicality, that we are, in fact, the expression of light, and that expression of light itself is the encoded, I will say, soul code of a sentient, soul-breathed human being. Yes. So now we cross over, uh, obviously, a little bit from science into theology, but I can't separate these disciplines. These are interwoven into Nigel's work. They're, they're interwoven into my own work. Even subconsciously, I've come to realize how much of um, 
the work behind um, Song of the Greys and Grey Aliens and Harvesting of Souls has bled over into my own work and research over the years. So I'm not claiming that everything I believe is original. I believe we're, we're, we're creatures of, uh, of constantly transferring knowledge back and forth. So to make this... Well, that's un- the real definition of science. Yes. Yes. So by transference here, if, if light is a basic unit of human consciousness, of, of, of what we'll call the Godverse expression of the human beings, to use some of Nigel's terminology, then this, this light encoding coming from DNA indicates something that goes beyond the mere physical aspects of the DNA material itself. Something that maybe we could say is extra dimensional in terms of how DNA expresses. Yes, it's part of this enlivenment pro- process that Nigel is is trying to outline in these books. And how that is a very different thing to making a machine. And, you know, his, his, the thing Nigel says so much is that really you cannot make a living thing out of, out of a machine. And this is a big mistake with society now, is that we're, we're thinking that the assumption in, in bio, biology and physics is that if you can make something complex enough, it will spontaneously acquire this, this um, consciousness. And really, that's just an assumption. So they keep trying to make things that are, are more and more complex in in order just to just to be able to express this consciousness. And yet, there is no ever any evidence that 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 might be the case. So a living thing is, in fact, Nigel Nigel says that really, if you take something like. Um, Bohr's uh, double slit experiment yes. where you get you, this is the basis of of quantum physics that quantum physics is really the understanding of where consciousness resides uh, in itself the thing is though if you have an observer that is necessary for the reality for instance of an electron being in a particular place or a, a, a particle of light being in a particular place rather than distributed throughout the universe um, if that obser- if that requires an observer to make it real then if we go backtrack that to the beginning the so-called beginning of the universe because everything looks like it's expanding so right back at the beginning then if that principle is true where you have initially nothing, then there must be an observer to make that real. And, and therefore, this is where um, Nigel is pointing out that there's an edge, if you like, to the universe. In fact, he points out that there are two edges to the universe. The universe is a juxtaposition of two primary poles of effect, that which is so essentially he calls one godhead in which which all order is is retained and it's got a, a tautological opposite of that so in other words if you can have something you must you can, if you can have nothing you must have something the the opposite of that is the pole is a pole if you like of absolute chaos in which um, and between those two you have what uh, you have a universe and so that the universe is is the is is how these poles uh, interact with each other, and so there's always there's always a little bit of each in in our universe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this goes obviously into the quandary we have between dualism and um, the singularity, what we call the singularity, which yeah, the singularity always implies its opposite. So that one must exist in order for the other to exist. Yes, they imply each other. And you find this a lot in, in Nigel's writings. You find it in the Bible, too, mm-hmm. where where you get these tautological arguments. I think Danielle's got something to say. Yeah, I was just going to talk about um, some, a piece of ev- evidence that's actually in the new book. 
And um, so at the moment with um, artificial intelligence, they're trying to make these quantum computers that resemble living systems because they've, there's something that living systems have in terms of intelligence that they haven't been able to properly replicate with artificial intelligence, and that's what they're looking for. And there's some research by a chemist from Berkeley called Bagita Whaley, and she studied the remarkable facility that living systems have to tap into the coherence of the quantum. And so she says, and this is a quote, when isolated quantum systems open up and interact with their atomic environments, they rapidly decohere. Decoherence is the main obstacle to building a quantum computer, yet somehow living states can tap into a coherent state. We don't understand all the details, but in the biological domain, nature doesn't appear to show the typical paradoxes associated with information processing in quantum physics. So if these grey alien entities are artificially intelligent um, I wouldn't call them beings, really, because um, according to um, Nigel's concept of what they are, they're not conscious, they're not beings like we are. That would be anthropomorphizing them. But let's say these, we'll call them entities. Um, if, they're, uh, if they're a form of quantum computer, because of the entropic rift, because of the second law of thermodynamics, that their quantum information field, which is all they are, a quantum information field, will be decohering. It will be breaking down. And as natural living entities with that connection to what John was describing and what Nigel is the paradigm of all Nigel's books, what he calls the Godverse, if we have that and that makes for coherence, that's their holy grail. That's what they're looking for. Absolutely. That's where we were going. <clears throat> this is a, a tough concept of whether you're discussing it from the quantum standpoint <clears throat> or from the... The, the soul aspect, the, we'll call it the theological aspect, <clears throat> the idea of basically um, soul harvesting or piggybacking off of the living soul, the living being, uh, which is obviously seen in our present format as, as, the, as the human on planet Earth. And that um, this... This form of parasitism, of attempting to gain access to something which they cannot have access to because by, by, by virtue of the fact that they are what they are, they cannot be this other thing, this other state, this other being, which comes from a completely different source. Yeah. You know, this is this is difficult to divide um, to understand that that, that 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 which is synthetic is formed in some ways from the material of the natural but does not have all of the aspects because some aspects of the living soul being are not physical and this is the limitation that we're bumping up against in a world which is driven by science so called or what I call scientism which is more a religion than an actual discipline itself absolutely that is why the dictionary definition of science now pertains to anything which is naturalistic so they've effectively taken half the argument away and then still try to make sense of it and it's a very difficult thing to try to do that I'm looking here at the, this is interesting, uh, in the text, this is from the um, Grey Aliens and uh, Artificial Intelligence, the battle between natural and synthetic beings, he writes, thus each soul is rather like a body of water that starts in the infinite ocean of the Godverse and networks out into oceans, seas, rivers, tributary streams and ponds. The network branches out into greater and greater states of separation, and its complexity reflects the level to which an individual's soul is fixed and held in situations of ignorance and thus capture and enforcement. The smaller the reservoir of water, the more polluted it is. The larger it is, the grander for the potential of the godlike to enter a person. Um, that almost seems like a, a, a thesis 
on complexity the way we view it. It's um, it's profound. It is. Absolutely. And there is so that network that he's speaking about, it's um, it, in a way it can be a very good model for understanding what the artificially intelligent gray um, agenda is for putting their data, their information field into us and piggybacking on our natural living capacity through that so if you look at it in terms of um, the new technologies technology in general as a principle really so not that technology in itself is a bad thing and it would be crazy to do what the uh, Luddites did at the time of the uh, agricultural revolution and smash everything up it's, it's something because we are now in a physical entrapped state technology helps right so that's not the point the point is whether we mortgage and invest our um, natural capacity for something much bigger than all of that into that technology so that we lose that grandeur. OK, so now, for example, we are, um, for, uh, let's say, social media. Everybody is very happily da- uploading their entire existence onto social media mm-hmm. and, and living through it. OK, so that in itself is living through an artificial lens, so to speak. We're pushing ourselves out into an artificial state. Um, people aren't speaking to each other. They're spending all their time on their phones. OK, that you, you go into any room and there's very little uh, human conversation conversation these days that's actually uh, face-to-face communication 20 people will be in the same or three people will be in the same room at a dinner table and they're all looking at their phones and looking at their messages okay um yes. so for, yeah so for example i went to um in to, to a church a sacre coeur in france with my yeah. family a few years ago and i was amazed because there were all these young people sitting in the pews right and they all seemed to be in prayer and i thought this is incredible in france there must be such religious devotion i don't see that in england <laughs> and and guess what they were doing I, I just noticed a few lights flickering they were texting they were all using the church as a place to sit down and use their phones and this seemed to be such a you know such a a, a metaphor a living metaphor for what is really going on these days because the thing about advances in technology is that when we we see them as so wonderful and so great and they are useful and they are helpful but what happens is the more we use something to help us so that we don't have to do it let's say uh, google to search for everything so we don't have to look in a book Mm -hmm. Um, google maps so we don't have to remember how to find things okay when you don't lose your faculties you use your faculties, you lose them. That's just a common common sense thing. If you don't practice those capabilities, you lose them. If we don't practice our natural human capacity for love, for connection, for human, for bonding, for caring, even for thinking creatively and imaginatively, so um, video games for children rather than playing imaginative games, we will become artificial constructs. And quite naturally, that is the spectrum, that's the continuum that we are going towards. And this is just a simple practical demonstration of how the alien agenda is being translated into our lives in real, palpable, tangible terms. Yeah, Nigel puts that very well, and by by talking about our, our love of things like computer games in chapter sixteen, by by actually uh, saying what Danielle's just said, but it, as 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 a game really, and how how you move and get increasingly trapped in it until you are within it, but then you just don't know you're you're part of the game. Yeah, you become lost in the binary world. Absolutely. It becomes more and more. So initially you start to enter the game. You've got to bear in mind that the meta and all of this is really a secondary reality to this. And this is a secondary reality to the consciousness itself. And so, you know, they're trying to persuade people that, okay, if we mess around with your biology, we can make you immortal. The problem is you're already immortal. And so you're really trying to sell, you know, um, ice creams to Eskimos here. 
<laughs> you know, you're, you're trying to sell somebody something to somebody that's already got the quality. And in fact, with a materialistic approach to longevity, because of the second law of thermodynamics, it can't continue. It has to break down in the end. And so it's it's really a false claim that they're trying to sell, sell people, where in fact, an understanding of, of how consciousness works in a more expansive way actually shows you by by bringing things together uh that's a permanent uh immortality and with that thought we're going to conclude what is segment one of a two-segment program that we're doing with uh, the subject of gray aliens and artificial intelligence is a deep subject that deserves as deep an exploration as we can make and um Obviously, Danielle Silverman and Professor John Biggerstaff bring incredible amounts of uh, earnest curiosity to the table as well as a a deep scientific background that was fostered by the late Nigel Kerner. We'll be back for the second segment very soon. I'm Randy Moggins. This is Off Planet Radio, offplanetradio.com and at Patreon forward slash Randy Moggins. The truth is inside you. Never give it away. You are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com. 